Welcome back to the Arise interview where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anya Goldu. Now, my next guest today, Ed Kerzon, is a remarkable man. He's a lawyer and an expert on Nigerian and African history. He's an author of books as well as documentaries that not only record and immortalize Nigerian and African history, but also often give a rather animated and spirited re-evaluation of that history going as far back as a thousand years. They include 120 great Nigerians you never knew, the Nigerian history photo book, Lagos, the birth of a city of style, and Nigeria, the real story of the amalgamation. His film, Onuna Ekulora, The Legend of Thurston Shaw, documents the archaeologist Professor Shaw's methodical excavation and interpretation of the Igbo Uku artworks, which prove that the people of southeast Nigeria were creating complex works of art more than a thousand years ago. For his work on African history, Ed Kerzo received the African Society Merit Award from Cambridge University. And the lawyer and historian Ed Kerzo joins me now via Cisco Webex from London. Um, really, really glad to see you, Ed, and very honoured to have you on the programme. And congratulations for the amazing work you've been doing and also the awards you've been getting. But let me start by asking you this. Um, what was your route into the world of history and specifically Nigerian and African history, which you've been internationally recognized for. Um, uh, apparently, you have to put on your microphone. Um, I, I, I understand we can't hear you. I don't know what the the technical reasons are, but uh, apparently your microphone is not on, and therefore we have to be able to... Okay, we can hear you now, so let me, let me ask you that question again. What was your route into the world of Nigerian and African history? Uh, so, well, thank you very much, Charles. Um, well, it's a lifelong, lifelong journey, so to speak. A lifelong journey, so to speak, uh, in the sense that I, um, I've always been I had an interest in history as a child. My dad's uh, historical texts were my bread and well, my food at the time, my breakfast at the time, even at the age of about eight. So um, even though I practiced, I studied, I trained as a lawyer and practiced and still do practice as a lawyer. History has always been a part of my DNA, a part of my, you know, a part of what I, what I occupy my time with, in more than a passing interest. And um, you know, if you if you do something long enough, you get re relatively good at it, I think. And uh, it began to be recognized by people who thought I could be of use in terms of documentation for, um, you know, for research studies and the like. And that, that really is, is a simple answer as to how I got here. I don't know if you can hear me because I can't see you anymore. But then, I mean, uh, don't worry, I, I can see you. And of course, okay. you also studied, I mean, as you said, you also studied law. I mean, because, I mean, I suppose given the rather shaky place, if I might call it that, that history occupies as a subject in Nigeria, I mean, you, you have to have another profession, don't you? That's a very good point. Um, the reality is that for me, um, law was my first professional choice in terms of uh, a course of study. Uh, and history was something that I just enjoyed, you know, like a hobby, like you play golf, you don't actually go and study golf, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> so as time went on, um, increasingly history began to occupy a bit more of my work time because you know you you prioritize obviously the, the what is your professional time first you know before your your your, your hobby and eventually from because from being merely a hobby it became quite a serious uh a part of my of my work and um and that's where you find yourself but yes you do you do make a good point you know you know let's let's be honest um as an as an historian a professional uh, you know as a trained historian you you find that you're you're either in academia or you're nowhere and um, I kind of like had, you know, organically had a career created by virtue of people recognizing that I had a skill and I had resources that were of value for their businesses, for 
for research, you know, academic research on the, on the wines. And in fact, I actually find myself working sometimes with academic institutions. So yeah, it was, it was a, very, a bit of a convoluted route. I mean, uh, uh, I, I guess by doing the whole sort of gamut of historical research, as well as, I mean, you know, writing books and producing and directing documentaries as you have, I mean, you've also had to learn an awful lot about funding, haven't you? Well, that's a very good, that's a very good point. Um, yes, it's, it's inevitable that if you find yourself in this space where you create content, you know, um, you're either going to self-fund or you seek funding, third, you know, third-party third funding, you know. And to be brutally honest, um, a lot of my work has been commissioned by, by third parties rather than me seeking funding for them from third parties. They've actually been commissioned by third parties. And you find, I mean, you find that sometimes there is a, there is a nexus of ideas between myself and those who seek to fund. For instance, my book, The Lagos Hamburg Line, uh, the history of the German commerce in Nigeria from the 16th century to till 2016 was an idea I had, and I, I had a chat with um, the uh, 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 consul of the German uh, embassy in Lagos at the time, uh, Aaron Aaron Mihershemi, as well as the uh, the, Gotha, the the director of Gotha, uh, and they 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 bought the idea, and for them it was kind of like a way of building content about German. Nigerian cooperation. So their funding came from there. You know, um, German companies obviously took out, uh, you know, they, they, they invested in the, in, the, in the publication. But at most times, they're commissioned. So on very few occasions, I actually have to pitch these to people. But the thing is, what you do is you make sure that these are accepted as some kind of angle that provides returns, either sentimental or commercial, you know, whether we like it or not. But at the same time, as an historian, you want to make sure that your work is you know, is not a historic in its content. You know, I don't do hagiographies. You know, I write historical, you know, non-biased historical data, you know, what's and all. And if you're commissioning me to write for you, yes, there will be a certain bias. By the end of the day, you have to be ready for the truth, which is why I'm very picky about who I take commissions from. I wouldn't take, I mean, if I write for you or about you or make a film about you, there's a certain level of respect that I have for you because if you expect me to hide your what's if you've got anything dodgy then clearly you shouldn't come to a historian you should go to um a hagiographer and there's quite a few out there i should say so yeah i don't know if i've answered your question in a very convoluted route but yeah that's really is that's my journey in terms of funding well i mean the work you've done so far i mean the and the honesty of it i have to say has impressed not just me but lots of other people and i mean you know you you, you talked about obviously the what sets you apart i suppose is that you're not just a historian from an academic point of view you're also a filmmaker you make documentaries and all of that so there is an aspect of what you do that is intertwined inextricably with the arts. I mean, does, does what you're doing now, the combination of all of them, suggest a sort of burning desire for the arts in general? I mean, did you as a young person say, this is what I'm absolutely determined to do or to be? Very good question, Charles. Wow. Um, the reality is that I'd always had a bent for, for, for the arts and you know, and the humanities. And, uh, you know, as I said, you know, you know, with a typical Nigerian setting, you go for a professional discipline by way of academic training. Uh, but I always had that bias towards, towards the arts. And the thing is, you know, if you're if you, going, I mean, going back to my training as a lawyer, you find that even the Evidence Act defines film, you know, documentary films, at least in their medium, in the physical medium, uh, 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 you know, films and documents as, uh, as documents. So in the same way you write a book, which is a document by way of, you know, by the classic definition, film is also a document. So as a lawyer, you're a documentarist in a way because you create, you know, you use the law to create either verbal arguments and that you use or verbal organic data. So that, 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 there's actually a linkage between, between all of these. And you find also as a lawyer, you're also a, you, you create, you're actually, you're actually a creative. Lawyers are some of the most vibrant original creatives there are out there just that obviously they have that image of being stodgy and starchy and uh, uh, conservative but then all of um you know as an historian you're, you're and even as a filmmaker you document and documentation is uh, you know particularly if you're a documentary filmmaker you have to be rigorous and you know and factual and and and, and credible in the content that you're creating 
you know, um, you know, you, you make an assertion in a documentary, particularly I made this, I know the documentary on the Nigerian civil war. Now, this is not the kind of documentary you want to produce, you want to rely on hyperbole or, or, you know, or, or, or create false data. It, data has, every, everything has to be rigorously fact-checked. There has to be evidential basis for, us, for, 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 for statements made within that. So, and you find there's a lot of linkage between that and a lawyer's work. It's, uh, history is evidence-based. History is actually a science in the same way that advocacy and uh, you know, at least the practice of law as by, uh, by way of advocacy is a, is a science. So in all of these, I think the arts, the sciences, the discipline, documentation, all came together as part of the same paradigm for me. And you know, just with different, at different stages of my life, one part came to the fore you know, before the other. Well, I mean, I have to say, just listening to you is absolutely fascinating and riveting. But I mean, we, we've got less than a minute before we have to take a break and then we'll keep talking with you after the break. But I mean, I'm going to put you on the spot and say, which do you actually prefer? <laughs> do, would you rather be a historian <laughs> and documentary filmmaker or a lawyer? <laughs> well, now let me be honest with uh, as a lawyer, you have very little latitude as to what you create. Um, your, your work is dependent on the client's needs. And with history, I'm a little bit more, I have a bit more agency in terms of the content I can create. So I would say that law will always be my first love, so to speak. But I would say that the, um, the, the distraction that history provides is very tempting <laughs> in terms of okay. my interest. I, th I think that's good enough for me. Stay with us, Ed. We want to talk with you some more. You're watching The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with the lawyer and internationally recognized Nigerian historian Ed Kerzel. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagoldo. My guest today, Ed Kerzel, is an historian, lawyer, filmmaker, and writer who spent the last nearly 30 years documenting the history of Nigeria and the making of this nation. Through his numerous books on the subject, as well as video documentaries and academic presentations, he's become a respected authority on Nigerian history and is regularly consulted by global media platforms, as well as the likes of Google Nigeria, for whom he was the consultant on a major project documenting Nigeria's historical sites. In addition to being on the board of a number of international historical societies, Mr. Kerzel is also a trustee of the Nigerian Legal History Society. And the lawyer and historian Ed Kerzel is still with me via Cisco Webex from London. Thank you very much indeed for staying with us, Ed. And just to uh, crystallize your purpose and your arguments in your books and documentaries for us. I mean, is there a strong need not only to record and immortalize Nigerian history, but also to reevaluate that history and give it a decidedly African perspective? Without question. Um, you know, for me, the, the, when I did a TED talk about seven years ago, um, I, I I, I, had to, I, was, I highlighted the fact that one of my triggers for beginning a formal research was the fact that um, the, 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 the denudation of the narrative of sub-Saharan Africa in global history, um, you know, the, 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 the Badon School of History, you know, spearheaded by legends like uh, Kenneth D.K., Tekna Tamono, Ade Ajayi, had, previous, had already started the work on a more uh, 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 nuanced historiography, of historiography being the study of history as a broad, uh, on a broad spectrum, a broad historiography that, that came from the African perspective. So what people like myself and my, my uh, although he's younger than me, but my senior in the profession, people like the incredible Professor Sahid Aderinto, you know, an absolute modern day legend, you know, have been doing is trying to is going into what's called the third wave of historiography, go, looking at specific themes as opposed to the broad theme of African history, but specific themes and highlighting those to show. Now, obviously, you know, it's not just about doing a PR job for Africa. It's not just about doing a PR job for Nigeria. You know, but it's about saying, look, let's look at our history objectively, but at the same time, let us be honest about what we see. But let's, at the same time, let us cease to discount our place 
within the timeline of, of world history. Let us highlight our great achievements, let us highlight our pitfalls, you know, by way of learning from them. But at the same time, what is most important is let us tell our own story. Let us uh, do our own research, read our own stories, and tell our own story from our own perspective. Because whether you like it or not, you know, um, there's no way that, uh, 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 um, uh, you know, a, a third party, and I, I say this with due respect to some incredibly, some really wonderful historians of non-Nigerian origin, can probably have the same same level of immersion, emotional immersion that we can, you know, although they do some incredible work, but the same immersion that we have. So it's about telling our story from our own perspectives. But then, you know, at the same time, we are part of a joined up global collective of both public historians and academic historians doing this. So I'm just one of many, you know, but I have been fortunate to have been blessed, you know, with opportunity of lots of work uh, and indeed the opportunity to have my work read and seen by, by people all over the world. And uh, in the course of your research, Ed, I mean, have you found that there are many more books written about Nigerian history by Europeans and non-Nigerians than by Nigerians? Yes, the, you know, the, the full bibliography, bibliography of uh, historical texts is kind of hard because, you know, they're, they're usual, you know, there are lots of ac academics, you know, Africanists, who produce works, uh, multidisciplinary works, you know, not just history, but anthropological studies that also have historical con content. You know, you find a lot of time people study, do a PhD, submit your thesis, and you get a book deal, at least of all when you're looking for tenure. And there's lots of texts out there that we don't even, we can't really do, I can't really answer the question authoritatively without doing a, um, a, a without doing an audit of, of texts out there. But what I can certainly say is that there is, there was better opportunity for, um, Afri for historians of Af uh, African historians, let's say histor historians of researchers in African history, to publish out of Nigeria. As you know, the Nigerian publishing industry suffered, suffered a great deal of, uh, you know, suffered a great deal from the financial crisis of the of the late eighties and early nineties. You know, books just weren't being published in the way they were in the seventies and eighties, for particularly for ac academics. You know, so there was definitely a, a long a gap which was filled by. Um, non-African historian, non-Nigerian historian. So I would say that non-Nigerian historians have a bit of a, an edge in terms of the, the list, but that would be, it's not, a, it's not a scientific statement. It's simply a guess that in terms of what we see, in terms of what we see there, have access to, there's more. But then Nigerians are catching up. Quite a few Nigerians are publishing some very, very powerful books, even non-academic non, uh, uh, historians, you know, historians, you know, you know, public historians are doing a lot of, producing some brilliant, brilliant texts. And, um, you know, we can only be the richer for it. Well, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll accept your sort of anecdotal um, evidence there. But, I mean, is, is that one of the reasons, at, at least, that made you look at Nigerian history more closely and begin to sort of jot down facts and get interested in documenting those facts? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Without question. Without question. I mean, I didn't quite finish the, um, the, the account I was giving about when I, one of the reasons that triggered my, you know, the actual, one of the reasons that actually triggered my, my formal study was that it was, in a, it was in a car with my kids and um, someone, you know, a right wing uh, commentator was, you know, was spouting about how a black African never contributed anything to, 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 to world history. And, you know, if that, if that doesn't trigger you as a person of any kind of intellectual pride, then nothing else will. And that's why it was imperative that I, on my, from my own little corner, you know, with very little by way of resources, even before I started my post postgraduate research, you know, had to start my journey of research and publication. So absolutely, yes, absolutely. Well, I mean, that, that, that's a very interesting point. And I think you tend to find those things when, when you know, quite a lot when you're abroad. Um, so in a sense, Ed, I mean, your, your whole sort of professional life as a historian and historian has been dedicated to revealing and sharing knowledge. I mean, archiving and documenting and annotating and categorizing that historical knowledge in a country that is still struggling with literacy and its, you know, its history as well as its self-knowledge. I mean, 
is that a big challenge or, or, or are many people in Nigeria sort of engaging with that history? I know you touched on this before, but I, I want to kind of, you know, get your take on, on, on this. Yeah, no, it, it is definitely it is definitely a huge challenge. You know, literacy definitely is a problem. And the thing is that one of the good things about, you know, uh, uh, making documentary films is that with the social media revolution, because I actually delivered a talk on this about how social uh, media demystified uh, Nigerian, Nigerian history uh, uh, at uh, Social Media Week some, some, some years back, is that with documentary, you can bridge that gap with making vignettes of, his, of, of historical documentaries that are viral. Now, the danger with that is that they're easy to make, which means that a lot of apocryphal tales are circulating virally on social media, you know, and being circulated, you know, even to, and obviously because it's in visual format, uh, in, you know, in audiovisual format, people are able to hear and assimilate. Now, clearly, if you don't, if that content is not credible, then what you end up doing is that you end up in a situation that's actually worse than if you, people had no access to information. It's better to have no information sometimes than to have patently false and dangerous data. So yes, it is a problem of which uh, films can bridge a gap, films within the context of uh, with the, using the vehicle of social media, you know, the mobile phone revolution. Absolutely, that's, that's you know, while we're still sorting out the questions of uh, dealing with literacy, uh, the, the, the literacy gap within Nigeria and Africa as a whole, right. films can work. And that's hopefully something that others will pick up on. Okay, Ed, I want to thank you very much indeed for taking the time to talk to us and congratulations on what you're doing and all the awards you're winning. Ed, uh, Kezo is a lawyer and historian and he was talking to me from London. Well, that's it for this edition of the Arise interview. Do join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja and London. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.